All right, welcome guys. We are gathered here this evening to go through 25 practice questions. Um, I think most of you I I've talked to in the past before, you've been here already. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started and let's, uh, let's get 100% this time, all right? <laughs> 100%, here we go. All right, question number one. Alice needs to hire a third party to conduct a test of her company's security posture. If she needs to determine whether and how an attacker could truly penetrate her company's defenses, which of the following services should she select? We've seen this one already. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Go. Hey. Bravo. Beat, bro. Bravo. Bravissimo. <clears throat> Layup. All right, number two. When a system official permits access to a file or program, what is it doing? When a system officially permits access to a file or program, what's it doing? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, go for it. Hey. Um, bravo. Bravo, oh, authorizing. Yeah. ID, yeah. auth in, auth or. In that order. Authorization is providing permission or authorization to resources. Number three, which of the following is the most common attack on DNS servers? I'm ready. Ready. Shoot. Hey. Hey. I'm looking at mostly B and Bravo. Like a ping or a ping flood or a, uh, what kind of flood? Well, flood is going to be like any classical. But it could be a typical. I don't know. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm we had that question before. Um, yeah, type, um, of DNS, or, type of denial of service. Yeah, we have seen this one before. I think we, I think we chose ping or flood before, but uh, but it was poisoning. DNS poisoning, you're um, changing the mapping of MAC address to IP address. Number four, what are the purposes of attribute value pairs and how do they differ between radius and diameter? Attribute value pairs. So radius and diameter are remote Triple A authentication protocols. Applications can be developed in accordance with them. I don't even know. It's so I don't even know what that is, ABPs. Yeah, I'm just taking a guess uh, based on, you know, the rule of elimination. I'm going to go with Charlie. Yeah, I'm not, a, I, I've never heard of attribute value pairs either. I'm going through these answers to see if, uh, if anything stands out. Yeah, I'm just now, uh, the reason I, I picked Charlie is because of the classical confidentiality and integrity mentioned. You know, that that's one thing I I do know that radius uses actually TCP and diameter uses TCP. I know diameter is the more improved version. I think it is. So, it is. Yep. Yeah. As I remember, I read that from the book, and <laughs> that's all I can. And if you think, I think of it's the, delta. You think of the radius of a circle being from the center of the circle to the outside. The diameter is the whole length across. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that's, I know it was in the Cybex. You were talking about that. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with delta. I'll take the hit for this one. Um, this is a guess. All right, number five. Linda has found out that two people who work for her who do not have the clearance level to know about certain military troop movement have learned about the activity and sold the information to enemy states. 
Which of the following best describes what type of issue is Linda dealing with? I'm ready. Okay. It's Delta. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm going for Delta too. It's definitely, it's not farming. Farmer's website, phishing, email. Yeah. Is there that or A? Um, A can't. Oh, never mind. Okay. Yeah, so so for me, aggregation is is when you collect information from multiple sources. Once you've collected multiple sources of information, inference is where you can deduce uh, you know information or, or, or stuff from a, at a higher level than what you should. Um, so for me, inference would be a little more applicable here, but I think this one is speaking to um, the issue at hand. I think the greatest issue at hand is, I'm not even sure I'd call it fraud. I, I'd call it um, espionage. <laughs> um, They're probably implying that they gathered the, they collected information to come to that conclusion. Yeah, but this this question to me isn't speaking about the method of collecting the information to be able to expose it. It's talking about just the exposure itself, and and this this is at the core of, of what it takes to read these questions and understand the true intent. Um, they'll they'll present these answers to you and and use words that we're familiar with in our study material but if you don't know exactly the intent of the question and a lot of times it's just not very easy so we know it's not fishing we know it's not farming we're torn between fraud and aggregation i'm gonna lean towards fraud doggone it but uh you guys can tell me about it if I'm wrong. Uh, huh? I think that's good. Okay. Oh, that's all I had to, but I know it wasn't. So, so you're in, you're in the in the barrel with me on this one. <laughs> yeah, I knew it was A or, A or D because I know what farming and fishing is. Farming is with websites and stuff. It definitely was not. All right, number six. Who has the primary responsibility of determining the classification level for information? Seeing this one. This is a layup. Go for it. Yeah, I'm ready. Bravo. Bravo. Data Bravo. owner. And I wish it would say data owner, not just owner. Number seven, a security kernel contains which of the following? I'm ready. Anyone else? Actually, I'm taking guess. I'm ready. All right, go for it. They. Actually, I'm just a guess. I have no idea. Anyone else? No, it's actually D. Actually, no. Security kernel. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So what you're thinking of hardware, software, and firmware. Oh, it's wrong. I read it wrong. Like, I just. I skipped the security kernel, the security. Now the kernel is ring zero, right? Where the most sensitive information is contained. Is the kernel, is the kernel, <laughs> kernel, is the kernel, does that consist of a policy protection mechanism and system design? I never seen security policy for the kernel, like when I think of kernel, I think of all the uh, the firmware and like you said, ring zero. I've seen these words before. Yeah. So, I guess. Um, the security kernel implements the reference monitor concept. Now, let's go ahead and take a guess here. I'm going to lean towards. I'm gonna go with Super Steve on this one. I've seen it somewhere, but you know it's encoded, but I can't recall it. 
<laughs> That's one thing I don't like about practice questions. But, uh, <clears throat> sometimes they're, they put the wrong em emphasis on the wrong syllable. You know what I mean? Um, all right, number eight. Which of the following is not a drawback of using hot sites? Not a drawback. <clears throat> I'm ready. All right, anyone else? Man, you are fast there. All right, go for it. It's Charlie. Yep, I agree. Hot sites are. I know we're not too. All at once, didn't see them match. Yeah. Um, available immediately, maximum tolerable downtime. Um, recovery time objective RTO <clears throat> is is what is is what's a, a benefit of a hot site. Maximum tolerable, I guess. Maximum tolerable downtime deals with how much time you can spend at the alternate site once you're there. And I guess with a hot site, you can uh, stay longer. Okay. Is the MTD like the amount of time you, you have until before it starts affecting businesses or like money, in terms of money? <clears throat> yeah, all of these deal with once you have a um, an incident that requires you to go to your alternate site, um, how how much time will it take for you to bring up operations at your alternate site? That's the recovery time objective. Um, uh, how much time can you deal without services? You're you know being operating and and and, and your process is not being implemented. Um, and then recovery time objective is how soon can you get the services up at the alternate site? And then MTD is how long can you operate at that alternate site? Yes, this is a combination, you know, what you want from an RTO and RPO. You require recovery point objective, and like you said, rightly recovery time objective. Yeah, and R RPO, I, recovery point objective, deals with the data at what point do you have the data that you need to implement your business processes? How much of the data do you need? Uh, but RPO is all about the data. All right, we'll, uh, we'll see their explanation on the back end for that one. Number nine, which of the following best describes a continuity of operations plan? That is your COOP. All right, anybody ready? I'm ready. All right, go for it. I think it's Charlie. Anyone else? I'm thinking more like Alpha. Yeah, I was thinking A or C, but uh, the B and, B and D is definitely not D, but B is like, it says, that looks like a disaster. <laughs> It's not it's not alpha. It's either B or C. I'm actually thinking Bravo. Um because a coop is something you're gonna implement um if you have a, a, a disaster that requires you to go to an alternate processing site. Uh, so you're you're going to plan to move your systems, your network, your applications after a um, disruption, and then you need oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah. you need that's to right. do contingency planning for each major system and application individually, so that you know how to recover them at your coop. Uh, Charlie, for me, 
just is just talking about communications. Yeah, I agree. After rereading it, I, I yeah, yeah. changed mine to B. Yeah, I, I read it too quick. I was thinking B was disaster, and I was like, oh, that's not that's DRP. <laughs> Yeah, but a disaster recovery plan <clears throat> is going to um, talk about moving to an alternate processing site. So uh, DRP and a coop are, are going to be, you know, a, a lot of places will, will have um, a DRP, a coop, contingency planning, all of those, and, and then uh, continuity of operations, all four of those wrapped up into one, you know. In some places, we'll have four different plans for each. Some will combine continuity with, um, you know, or continuity of operation. At the core, at the end of the day, continuity of operations is your overarching thing. Your, your overarching theme is to maintain business operations. Disaster recovery, contingency planning, COOP, those three can fall underneath your your um uh, continuity of operations. I mean, you're, um, um, yeah, maintaining business continuity. But every, again, every place I've been, they do it a little differently. They combine them or they mix them up. It's almost as difficult as uh, implementing a risk management plan at an organization. Everybody seems to do it differently. I think the key, though, is just making sure that everyone understands whatever process is being implemented at the organization and uh, and knows what their role is. <clears throat> All right, number 10, what is the biggest challenge for network-based data link prevention? NDLP, we've seen this one before. I'm ready. This is a layup for right. what? Uh, I think it's problem. I disagree. Uh, I'll go for D. Um, actually, we've seen those some before, and it is so network-based data leak prevention. You can do all the data leak prevention methods you want to protect net, network information or information on the network, but if someone brings a mobile device in, they can take that data out of the building. Oh, I see. I, that's what they were implying. And by the way, as far as mobile devices are concerned, we're even talking about thumb drives, because I've seen yeah. that happen in the banking industry. So that's why I went ahead and picked feet. I thought the the host uh, DLPs prevent those uh, USBs from us extracting. They can, but most people don't implement it. Believe it or not, it's kind yeah. of scary. <laughs> Yeah, and this this one is speaking just about network based. <clears throat> all right, number eleven, business continuity plans address all of the following except business continuity is our overarching objective. Already. Hmm. All right, go for it. I am going for C. It's either C or D, I think. Well, I'm going for C. It's Charlie. <sighs> I'm not sure if they do D either, because that kind of like 50-50 there. Well, if we're going to maintain business continuity, that means all of the business processes we have in our organization, whatever tools or whatever people are being implemented to run them are there and working. If there is a disruption to business continuity, then we'd have to go to a remote location. Um, so I think Delta may be the outlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It says operations personnel. I guess if they lose, uh, if they can't operate, then I guess you're right. Yeah. 
uh, you know, when it comes to business continuity and people being able to perform those business processes, you need your servers up. Um, you need to know what your critical devices are so that if something happens to them, you can have a contingency plan to get them back up to get up as, and running as quickly as possible, which may not involve going to a, a remote site. And then you need your individual workstations. Now, I was kind of thinking Charlie might be it because they, I think just because they said individual workstations, like that, that seemed like it was too far down in the woods. But uh, yeah, but what if it's like a line of help desk people in like some some help desk shop, and then they all can't operate or answer phones? <laughs> I'm gonna see so the reason why I don't the reason why I don't think it's C is because of the word individual. That tells me that somebody who has their own personal day to day workstation doesn't need to be part of this business continuity plan. That's that was that's what I took from that. Yeah. I'm assuming here that this is talking about maintaining business operations at the primary processing site, um, but we'll see. We'll see on the back end. Number 12, June is creating a security awareness program to inform the workforce of a change in security policy. Which stage of the common development process of security policy is June in. She's creating a security awareness program. What stage is she in? I am ready. Okay, go for it. I go for Bravo. Yep, creating and developing are synonymous, in my opinion. I agree. Anyone disagree? Uh, yeah, I'll go for me. All right, there we go. Um, you got a point? Oh, I was just gonna say that previous, that previous, the one next behind this one, I was wrong. I, it, it is C, not D. I, I misread the question the first time around. Okay. So you think it's but Charlie? That's all I was gonna say. Yeah, I do. And not Delta? That's correct. Okay. Because the toll side does still need to be protected. Whether that's just a lock or or a security guard or something, but I mean, it's still gonna be protected. <clears throat> and I, I, that was it. That was all I was gonna say. Okay. It's actually Charlie. The other, the other gentleman was correct. All right, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll see their explanation at the end here. All right, number 13, part of the collection and identification stage of the evidence life cycle is marking or labeling evidence. Which statement is not true regarding marking evidence? Okay, anybody? I'm going for a guess. <laughs> this one's kind of tough. <laughs> Never seen this one before. Yeah, I'll go for Alpha. Which statement is not true regarding marking evidence? I was thinking C, but that was just a total guess. Yeah, I'm thinking A because why would you want to it's Charlie. add anything to, to the evidence, right? I thought the main evidence, they always like put it in put some tape or something on it to identify it. There has to be some type of identifier. Well, yeah, uh -huh. but you don't want to mark the tape because the tape's going to be cut when they go to examine the evidence. That's why it's Charlie. Uh, I'm wondering why Bravo says seal evidence in envelopes. Is evidence always going to fit in an envelope? I thought they do it in regular like Ziploc bags too, like you see on TV. I mean, what if it's a gun? <laughs> you know, that's not gonna fit in an envelope. Yeah, they they dump in the bag. I know. Those uh. Clear... They all use. They all use tubs now, containers. Yeah. 
I would assume they're saying it's a range of evidence, right? So when they're saying seal evidence in envelopes, they may be meaning, meaning something that can actually go into an envelope. Could be just some papers, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see your point now. Yeah, it could be yeah, that. Yeah, because uh, they're they specifically they, telling uh, you what the evidence is, right? They have those anti-static, uh, I know they in digital forensics, they have those anti-static bags for the electronics. So that could be uh, false right there, seal evidence and envelopes. Yeah, I just, I, I, I hate that answer. I'm going to go with it just because I hate it. Yeah, because uh, which I, is I think it's still alpha. My take. Okay, all right. Re remember this one and tell us <laughs> you're wrong when we come back to it. <laughs> all right, number 14. Jonathan works in a highly secure environment where user and data classification is closely monitored. There are very few privileged users who can access all devices at a privileged level. When dealing with this type of access level, which is true? I am ready. All right. Anyone ready? Uh, yeah, right. I'm ready. Bravo. I'm ready. Yeah. Bravo. 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 Yeah, I think that's pretty obvious. <clears throat> Number 15, which of the following best describes a centralized repository of information about data, such as meaning, relationships to other data, origin, usage, and format? Did we come across this one? Yeah, yeah. I remember you. Know. I'm ready. Go for it. It's uh, it's B. I think we said A, and you got it wrong. Yeah. It was it was the same question? I think it's the same question. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember we picked metadata, and you said you'll never yeah. get it wrong again. <laughs> Maybe a metadata directory. <laughs> you know, but a data dictionary is the same as a metadata directory. Okay. Yes, that, I remember that's exactly, that's what you said. <laughs> All right, uh, 16. How does an acoustical seismic device detect an intruder? I'm ready. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm ready too. All right, go for it. It's a uh, yeah. Logically, it should be a uh, yeah. Because acoustic uh, sound is always a uh, vibration. I grew up in California, so earthquakes. We have the seismic reader. I could tell you how big the earthquake was. Yeah, I didn't actually know what that device was, but when I saw acoustic, I was like, "Yep, yeah. that's by the sign, basic science." All right, 17, uh, Roger calls into a customer service center and pretends to be affiliated with the company in order to gain secured information. What tactic is Roger using? I'm ready. I'm ready. For it's a layup. Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. Social engineer, Jedi mind trick. Number 18, a trusted computing system generally contains all of the following except... I'm ready. The computing system. All right. Go for it. I am going for B. Yeah, it is Bravo. Yeah, I pick Bravo too because it's. I think those were like third party stuff, right? So that's that one. Right. So I mean, I, I I agree that antivirus is is a joke. But it's it should be at the core of every um, trusted system. You have to have it. So what, what's your rationale? I was thinking because they were third parties. Like I didn't think a trusted competing system uh, would have that. Or more importantly, like you know, certified or an authorized antivirus and spyware program, right? Because this just tells you it's an AV or a spyware, right? It doesn't tell you if it's actually, it's something that's a standard, you know. Um, be anyone, but. For me, and and hold on a second, guys. Let me pull up something that I think is, is, is uh, something is pulling me towards Delta. 
Would it be Delta? Yeah. I'm being pulled towards Delta. Um, hold on a second. I could see Delta too, because that that kind of doesn't even make sense here for me. And this is one of those questions where you have to pay attention because when I see trusted computing, I'm thinking TCB, not not system. So that's why I changed it to Delta. Uh, give me just a second here. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking through my, my muscle memory charts <clears throat> and I'm looking at things. Let me just show, I'm not finding what I, what I wanted to find, but let me just show you guys real quick uh, what I'm trying, what my rationale is for what I'm trying to find. Uh, I think, uh, Gordon, could you uh, put your, your mic on mute for me? Sure. Appreciate it. And, and, you know, of course, until you want to talk. Um, so these are the security modes. These are uh, any operating system or, or any uh, operating system application, database, anything that uh, has an authentication mechanism can be built in accordance with these. Um, so modes, what I'm looking, I'm looking for trusted but I don't see it here. Uh, are any of these trusted? I don't see it here either. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't see what I'm looking for, but uh, I'll take the hit for this one if it's wrong and we'll learn something on the back end. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All right, number 19, which type of access control model allows data owners to be the ultimate source for determining access to system resources? I think I All right. All right, go for it. Say. Say again? A. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, now data owners could be, now if we're thinking of data owners as a, a single high level individual that determines access to information for everyone, then that would be mandatory. But if we're thinking of individual users who create data and they own it, then that would be discretionary. So, <laughs> you know, which with this question, I don't think gives us enough information to to know the difference between those two options. Oh yeah, you could try. I'm thinking that uh, th this was taking account that whoever created the uh, like file or data, and it's giving them the ultimate. Uh, but uh, data owner is that high level individual who classifies the data, and then he is right. the data custodian, the, the responsibility of protecting that data, Ish. that would be mandatory, right? That'd be like a system administrator having the key, keys to the kingdom and deciding who can access what based on the data owner. Uh, uh, now, now that you talk about that, you, that could be right. Question doesn't give us enough information. I'm gonna go ahead and go with uh, you know, so it's a management level exam. We're supposed to think like a manager. Uh, when in doubt, I'm going to think at a higher level than a lower level. I'm going to say mandatory, but I acknowledge that you might you might be right. Like, when I think of mandatory, like the military uses those Mac thing, Mac controls, and they it's like the most strict, and that's why it didn't stick with me. Yeah, mandatory. You have a central authority who determines what objects subjects have access to and discretionary the individual users 
um, without having that central authority, the individual users who create and own objects or files can allow um, permissions or access to those resources at their discretion. But we'll see. All right, number 20, how does a proximity intrusion detection system work? All right, I think I'm, I'm ready here. Anyone else? I'm ready. Go for it. I think that it is uh, C. Anybody else? Yeah, go for C too. We had a question very similar to this. I'm not sure we picked A, but that was a different question, I think. I'm thinking Delta because proximity means that you get close enough to something um, and it's usually a magnetic field once you break into that, you know, proximity of the the, the reader or the um, the device itself. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> if we don't do good on this one, I'm gonna have to take the take the blame for it. But I'm not feeling too good about this one. <clears throat> All right, 21 uh, VoIPs integration with TCP IP protocol suite has brought about immersed security challenges because it allows malicious users to bring their TCP IP experience into the relatively new platform where they can probe for flaws in both the architecture and the VoIP systems, which of the following is one of the most serious concerns when implementing VoIP. Yeah, I was interested to see or curious to see where they were going with this, but I think I'm uh, ready. I think I'm ready. All right, go for it. I think it's the. Anyone else? Uh, I was going to select T as a guest because uh, it didn't seem like that one. I'm actually leaning towards Alpha, I think, for the same reason as Ramit. But I, I'm thinking, you know, with, with VoIP, you don't have to, well, you do, you have to log into the application, show a username and ID, but when you make calls, I'm assuming there's no authentication. You're not proving that you are who you are, and therefore accountable for what you do afterwards. I want to go with that one, but I don't like it. I don't feel good about it. I don't feel good about this session <laughs> or, our, or my performance on it, but we'll see. All right, 22, a system file that has been patched several times becomes infected with the virus, but the antivirus software warns that disinfecting the file may damage it. Which of the following is the best choice? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, go for it. Delta. Delta. Yep. I agree. I feel good about that one. All right, 23. Larry is in charge of presenting risk assessment calculations to his boss uh, by the end of the week. He concludes that a server with heavy traffic has an annualized loss expectancy of 15,000 with an annualized rate of occurrence of five. What is the server's single loss expectancy value? I'm ready. I'm ready. Go for it. B. Bravo. Bravo. 15,000 divided by five is 3,000. Number 24, Kim is a data custodian for her company. She has many duties to perform each day. Which duty would be considered out of scope in her position? Uh, 
I'm ready. I'm ready. Ready. Go for it. Charlie. Delta. I heard Charlie and Delta. Anyone else? Uh, Delta. Uh, uh, troubleshooting system problems that affect user productivity. I'm actually leaning towards Charlie establishing baselines for data. Well, uh, I don't, I don't like NIST does that stuff like the 88 pack R or something like baselines are, uh, are standards. You know what? You're right. I'm just thinking data owner, not custodian. He is correct. Actually, you know, I think I've seen something like this before. But with Delta troubleshooting system problems, the data custodian is not going to be troubleshooting system problems. The system administrator is going to be doing that. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, because my logic was you know, a data custodian may not even have access to the systems uh, yeah. to figure out what's yeah. broken. Yeah. You're right. I'm going to have to go with this one for that reason. Um, but we'll see if they they try to trick us. All right, 25, which of the following statements about the transmission control protocol and user datagram protocol is not correct? TCP and UDP. I'm ready. I'm ready. Is not ready. correct. It's, I'm ready. Uh, go for it. It's Bravo. Not. Say again. Bravo. Bravo. Anyone else? I'm going for Delta for this. I thought. Uh... Yeah. Uh, so this one is which one is not correct? Uh, TCP is. Oh yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You yeah. more than that. I heard it other way around here. Yeah. They both have ports. Uh, so uh, all right. Cross your fingers. I'll take the blame for this one. Ooh, goodness. Ooh. Won't be posting this one. <laughs> uh, then again, I, wow. I, don't, I don't care about these test results. All I care about is seeing new questions and new content that we haven't seen before. So uh, it could be any kind of crazy logic for why they, uh, why a question is right or wrong. All right, uh, pen testing. We've seen this one before. That was pretty easy. Um, uh, permitting official for access to program authorizing. That was easy. DNS poisoning is the most common attack on DNS. Let's see here. Um, yeah, this this one we we weren't sure what the heck it was. We were guessing on it. AVPs are constructs that outline how communication will take place between communicating entities. The more AVPs that are present in a protocol, the more functionality and capability that protocol has. Diameter has many more AVPs than radius. We've already established that, rate, that diameter is um, newer and better than radius which is why it can authenticate devices in many different ways and have more functionality through its peer-to-peer -peer model. All right, diameter has many more AVPs, which allows the protocol to have more capabilities and radius. All right, we learned something. Oh, you guys are right about this one. Aggregation is the act of combining information from separate sources. So, I mean, we knew that, right? But this question, to me, wasn't focusing on aggregating. It was focused on what they did with the, you know, once you aggregate, you then have to infer. And then once you infer, what do you, what you do with that is what this question was getting at, for, in my opinion. I think they made the assumption. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't like this question. Um, the combination of the data forms new and the combination of the data forms new information that's inference which the subject does not have the necessary rights to access the combined information has a sensitivity that is greater than that of the individual parts that's um, 
inference. Lenda's employees could have rights to access data at lower levels and may have put the information together to learn about troop movements. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Uh, I just didn't feel as though that question was speaking to aggregation, although I thought it would be espionage instead of fraud, but hey, <clears throat> whatever. Uh, primary responsibility for classifying information is- Hey, Donald. Uh-huh. I was just I was just going to say on that last question. Remember, you always taught us to take the one that comes closest to the correct answer. And fraud is, is not anything part of this question. That's why aggregation is the closest to the correct answer, which is espionage, like you said. Well, for, for am me, I right? For me, aggregation is two or three steps removed from the intent of this question. Because you have to aggregate, you have to infer, and then you have to do something you're not supposed to do. For me, fraud was closer to the intent of this question because it dealt with them having access to information they're not supposed to have access and then giving it away or you know, giving it to the enemy. That was the what, what stood out for me. But yeah, okay. <clears throat> this just goes to okay. show. You can know this information inside and out. And when you sit on that damn exam and read these questions, your dominance over this content is, is just as valuable as your ability to understand the intent of the question. <laughs> you know, it is a, a true battle. Uh, all right. Security kernel contains which of the following? Security kernel makes up the main components of the trusted computing base, which is made up of software, hardware, and firmware. Security kernel performs a lot of different activities to protect the system, enforcing the reference monitor access rule. Security kernel enforces the reference monitor concept or access rules. Uh, it's just one of those activities. That, that's all. Great information there. Uh, which of the following is not a drawback of a hot site? The immediate availability of a hot site is a definite advantage, not a drawback. Let's see here. Describes a continuity of operations plans or plan. Huh. Continuity of operations plan establishes senior management and a headquarters after a disaster. Well, you know, continuity of operations doesn't necessarily mean that you've had a disaster and you have to go to an alternate site. Uh, so I don't like this question for that reason. Continuity of operations could mean that uh, uh, an important, uh, you know, a, a database a part of your database could go down and, and a business process can't be performed in an automated manner the way it used to be. So you have to go to a manual process to maintain um, business continuity. Um, the yeah. reason I picked A was, you know, I saw operations in the, in, in the bigger scope of the business, right? Is the business operating or not? How do I get the business to operate? Well, no, I, think I, said, I didn't say B because the, they said recovery right there, and that automatically like blocked in my head. Was like just it couldn't be B. Now that's why I said it. Yeah. What what threw me off was the, the paper that says establish a senior management. We already know who senior management is. Yeah, because uh, yeah. The, the question, if you look at from an operation plan, is that uh, the establishing senior management, the assumption is maybe some of them are not available or, or something has happened, and that's the reason you're in, in a situation like this, right? Because I was looking, uh, I was frankly just seeing this from a business question. I was not even seeing this from any technical perspective. Yeah. I, I guess I see what you're saying. It's kind of like a designated survivor. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That makes right. sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I see your point there. Yeah, 
because you see the second part of that answer is outlines roles and authorities order of succession individual or, or role task right yeah. so the assumption is that something has to change because of whatever has happened yeah okay good stuff um network based data link we've seen this one before sensitive data usually traverses a choke point during exfiltration whether or not it can be easily identified by content but mobile devices containing such data can easily be removed and i think like you said a thumb drive or external hard drive or something like that can be considered mobile data business continuity plans address the following yeah except a BCP does not address the protection of cold sites at remote hey, locations. Uh, sorry, I, don't know. I think I screwed up your screen again. Is that I tried to cancel it. Now, why, why are, I'm the organizer. Why are you the presenter on here? I don't know why. Like I was just clicking some uh, to pull to exit out the full screen. And I always click that button. You know, I think it's because you're the first one that signs on. Yep, that's what happens. Every time. <laughs> hey, Donald, keep in hack. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, but this is a classic issue with uh, these meetings. I, I have the same challenge with WebEx. Yeah, so. oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's keep going. <clears throat> All right. Uh, business continuity plans address all the following. Except, yeah, we talked about that one. Oh, publication. June is creating a, an awareness plan to inform her workforce. That doesn't mean she's ready to publish it. She's creating it. Which state? Uh, I think the key word was uh, of a change. I was thinking it was something else like uh, maintenance or updates or something. Yeah, but she's still creating it because of it because of a policy change. She's creating the awareness program. The common development process of creating a security policy includes initial and uh, evolution, development, approval, publication, implementing, and maintenance. <clears throat> uh, this is a classical CSSB trick question. Yeah. yeah, that was a tricky one. I was thinking it would be like updates, so fall in maintenance because they're updating it for this change. Now, they said that June has created an awareness program and is going to inform, you know, her users of a security policy change. That, to me, would be publication. But not June yeah. is creating. Right. So, yeah, yeah, the key is it says, uh, if, sorry, if you go back, it says a change in the security policy, a change in that that something new is being introduced, right? That should generally mean a development, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. It is what it is. I know. Yeah, for me, June is creating. That, 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 anyway, all right. Ooh, yeah, never mark on the original evidence. I think somebody said that, right? Yeah, that's me, yeah. Yeah, right. because the logic is and uh, logic is you know what if what is on that evidence is required to be you know it's part of the part of the evidence itself right yeah yeah so so you want to put some tape over it and write on the tape not the actual evidence itself i still right. don't like the fact that all evidence is going to go in an envelope um yes yeah, so, yeah. so, so, so <laughs> Logic behind was uh, when I said was the is because they haven't tell you what kind of evidence, right? It could be a piece of paper, right? So it could be an envelope, right? So it says uh, I, it is acceptable to write on the actual evidence as long as it doesn't damage it. Um, in these cases, the evidence should also be stored in an envelope, which should be labeled and uh, or should uh, should be labeled as well. Were you going to say something, Steve? I was like, I swear, I thought for like electronics, like for hard drives or something where you don't want to damage the integrity that they were uh, supposed to be stored in like an anti-static bag. And I know I've seen that in one of my classes or I read it somewhere. Yeah, for digital media, you want to make a copy of it 
a working copy and you're going to do your testing on that one not on the original yeah and that's what i assumed this question was implying like yeah. it was different. all right privilege users should routinely be recertified um uh, yeah that that was a pretty much a layup for us there yeah, we got that one right. Data dictionary or a metadata repository. Um, meta, metadata dictionary or um, metadata directory is a centralized repository of information about data. Data about data. Uh, acoustic, uh, acoustical seismic device with a change in vibration. Uh, this one was a layup, Jedi mind trick. Ooh, I was wrong about this one. You guys are right. Antivirus and spyware uh, utilities are generally not considered an integral part of a trusted computer, but rather add-on features. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. And that's exactly what you were saying, right, Steve? Yeah, because I was thinking third party because I know Microsoft they come with Defender and I'm like, how about Linux? Linux don't really come with anything. Yeah, they've got Linux has uh, I forget what they have. Um, but I think it is a feature that has to be turned on. It's not uh on by default. Yeah, you were right again, Steve. <clears throat> uh we weren't sure or I wasn't sure where to uh, where the a true intent was with this question. A system that uses discretionary access control enables the owner of the resource to specify which subject can access specific resources. Um, so when they say a data owner, uh, I didn't know if that was the actual user that owned the data or if this was a high level data owner that assigned a data custodian yeah that could be kind of confusing because uh when you read that section like the love hour like you said the high level high level data owner and then the system owner all that stuff yeah that could be kind of confusing <laughs> so on those tricky ones yeah all right um proximity uh i, I got one right dog on it um a change in magnetic field uh, got another one right. VoIP is um, uh, <clears throat> SIP-based uh, signaling suffers from the lack of encrypted call channels and authentication of control signals. Yeah, this one was uh, was pretty easy for us. Restore and unif uninfected version of the patch from a file backup. Uh, this was a layup too. SLE times ARO equals ALE. Therefore, SLE equals ALE divided by ARO. You have to be a mathematician. This basic algebra you divide to get to the other side. <laughs> well, you want to you want to get SLE by itself on this side. Uh, it's multiplied by ARO. You want to move ARO to the other side of the equal sign, so you do the opposite of multiplication, which is division. ALE divided by ARO. Uh, baseline for oh, got it right. No, yep. Yeah. Establishing base. That was you too, Steve, right? I'm thinking that is 88 because I actually have to do that work. <laughs> Determining when uh, data should be purged is responsibility of the data owner, not the custodian. Data owners should be aware of the legal, regulatory, and policy issues surrounding how long data is to be kept. Once the data owner decides that particular data should be purged, the data custodian would most likely be tasked with conf configuring a system to carry out. See, and I, I know that, right? I know all of that. But when you read the question, it'll trick you into thinking something that you know or something other than what you know. Well, you just gotta do the best you can. 
<laughs> yeah, at least you're getting like the 50-50s and you we're just getting the 50-50 wrong. So you so can... it's my it's my belief that you're gonna get enough layups on the exam to pass it. Then you're gonna get these 50-50s where you can make up some ground if you slipped up on the layups. And then you're gonna get those really hard ones. You could not get any of the hard ones and still pass. You could get just a few of the 50-50s and still pass. You got to get those layups. You know, those easy ones, you got to slam dunk those. <clears throat> so, you know, I say all that to say, don't let these practice questions discourage you. Keep doing them. If you're not getting the kind of results that you want, um, that's not what's important. What's important is that you're not seeing information that you haven't seen before. Uh, because even if you know the information, like we've proven tonight, even if you know the concepts and the terms inside and out, your biggest challenge now is how you interpret the question. And that is, you know, that's just <clears throat> no one can be perfect at that. So, all right. Uh, that is it for tonight, guys. We're not we're much beyond an hour. So uh, appreciate it. Right on. Hey, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Hey, Donald. Uh-huh. You still there? Yeah. I was going to tell you, I, I, I watched the videos the other day, the new ones. They're really good. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoy listening back to them. I mean, it, it, I, I learned more listening back to them than I did going through them the first time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I, can... well, I just thought I'd let you know. I okay. thought they were really good. Well done. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Take care. See you on Thursday. All right. Bye. So you guys meet uh, what every week? Uh, every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Wow. And are you are you going in sessions like uh, covering different chapters of a book or just randomly? Um, just randomly. So this is uh, this the site that we're using is called Total Total Testers. It's an online bank of practice questions, um, and we turn on all eight domains so we can get questions from either domain. Okay. Um, do you have any like a uh, face-to-face -face training that you guys provide? Yeah. So, so if you go to um, write this down, it's a cyber sec study, cyber S E C study dot com. If you go to that website, I've got um, you know I I I went through a bunch of different sources and just identified the smallest grouping of terms and concepts that I thought were important for you to, to be able to pass the exam. Um, and I, I, I wrote definitions for all those, <clears throat> put all that into a, a training manual. Um, and you can find that there either on hard copy or soft copy. And I recorded all of that information into an audio format. So you can download those audio podcast episodes and listen to those, you know, commuting to and from work. Um, and then Based on that content, uh, we do boot camps where we go over all the material together, uh, a two-week boot camp. Um, and in those boot camps, we have um, online quiz competitions on, on a system called Kahoot, where you get to you know practice or test your knowledge of the information and, in a competitive way where you're competing against other people. But at the end of that quiz, it gives me a, a spreadsheet, a printout of all the questions you got right, all the ones you got wrong. So then we can have one-on-one -on -one sessions where I can show you where you're weak and where you're strong, and we can talk about the stuff that you're weak on. Um, and then after all that, we do these practice question sessions. Yeah. Um, big mistake. I mean, it's big because mistake. of how they word the questions, and they do that purposely. And, and, and it's a vocabulary exam. So if your 
if you don't have a damn near perfect English, you know, uh, grasp on, 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 you know, English vocabulary, then you're going to struggle. If, if English is, is your second language, then you're, you're going to struggle. Um, you know, that, that yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, when I went to become um, my result. Yeah. And, and that's all about how they, you could, you could know this information inside and out, worked in this field for a number of years and be one of the best cybersecurity practitioners in the world. But if you can't interpret the meaning of their question and they're really trying to trick you, um, then, then, you know, it's a vocabulary exam. So that's one of, one of the things we focus on is how to interpret the true meaning of the question based on the little clues that they give us. So, so the data owner is going to classify the data. The data custodian would assign access to it based on what the data owner classified it at, right? Yeah. So, so, it, so yeah. those, that's an example of a layup that, that we talk about a lot in our course material. So if you get through our course material, you're going to be able to slam dunk those layups. And if you can get slam dunk all those layups, then I think you could pass. And, and then beyond the layups, there are going to be those 50-50 ones where I think you're going to be able to make up some ground too because you're going to get some of those 50-50s. Um, but then some are just so hard that we just, we know we're not going to get them. We just, you know, focus on the ones we think we can get. Yeah, I saw, I got a few questions that I, I got no, no clue even what it meant to me. It was like kind of talking about you know, rocket science. Yeah, so that, that tells me that that one was a layup. And, and just hearing what that question was, that was a layup question. Um, and, and that probably wasn't the first one that they felt was a layup. And, and uh, you know, maybe the second or third one, they say, that's it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to join you. To, um, I'm going to visit your site to see, you know, what I can do. And also, I will, come, I will join your next meeting. Okay. You say Tuesday and Thursdays? Yep, Tuesday and Thursday at 9 o'clock and then Saturday at 12 noon. Wow, you're pretty busy. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to trying to get this thing going. I want to I want to do more boot camps and um, you know, doing this helps me you know, generate interest and get people um uh, who who are on the fence, get them off the fence and start to to get, you know, get to work. I'll see. I mean, I'll see probably. I mean, I don't I would see what, what do you have more courses than this? Um uh, right now just CISSP. I'm working on Security Plus uh right now. Okay. Um, and then I'll eventually do CEH and uh, and probably uh, CAP. Yeah. All right. I appreciate it. And, and look, we're gonna. Um, I'm trying to find a, a a site where we can meet on Saturdays. So I want the Saturday session to be in person. Uh, we'll still include people who who can't be on site, but um, at least at least like for those of us in the same area to be able to get together. In person, so I'll keep you posted on that. Sure. And how long you have been doing this? Uh, well, I've been training for um, over 10 years, uh, actually almost 15 years, and um, uh, the 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 meetup I've had for about three years. But you know, it went dormant for a long time, and I'm really just ramping things up um, over the past month or so. I see. I see. You know. All right. All right, man. So I'll see you on Thursday. Um, you know, if there's any, you know, messages you want me to post, I mean, we have 500 people, I believe. I can oh, wow. post it. You never know. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, 